I watched a midnight movie starring Matthew Modine, who I thought was supposed to be Dr. Carter on ER, but I searched his filmography, and he was, in fact, not Dr. Carter on ER. Or maybe it was, and it just wasn't on the filmography. So whatever the equivalent of a 1990 fuckboy is. And also Michael Keaton. Which, like, where do y'all stand on the attractiveness of Michael Keaton? And this movie is Pacific Heights from 1990. If you're asking yourself, why would she choose this while I have background? I'm trying to find this movie from the late 80s slash early 90s about this couple who have a neighbor. And I, I guess he was a murderer? The only scene I remember, it was like a back and forth kind of thing where everybody's doing the McNasty. And the creepy neighbor, from what I remember, looks like Mad-Eye Moody, and he had a candelabra, and he poured wax on a lady, and I guess she died. And then the guy out of the couple looked like the dad from Little Monsters, from what I remember. I could have dreamt this whole thing, but I'm fairly certain I remember it right, and it was on Cinemax between 2005 and, like, 2010. Well, anyway, since then, I've been on the hunt, so I chose this. And I thought for a while this was it, but it was not. Or I don't think it was. It's a yuppie couple, and we'll come back to that, but it's a yuppie couple, and they decide to buy an old Victorian in Pacific Heights, uh, San Francisco, which apparently, I guess, is a really expensive neighborhood. And then they get a tenant. I call him a tenant. He signed the lease papers, but he never paid any fucking rent. So tenant slash squatter? Which, I'm not certain what his whole plan is. He's releasing roaches in the building, and he's, like, hammering at all hours of the night, and he's completely destroyed this fucking apartment. But I think he's supposed to try to drive him out for them to put the house on the market so that he can buy it up, and then he has all this property. Or that's what I think is going on. Basically, he's becoming the world's worst tenant so that he can buy really expensive property at rock-bottom prices. So are you ready for the details on this and why I think this ages well, but it also doesn't age well? So here we go. Okay, keep in mind, this is 1990. We're at the tail end of the 1980s boom. However, it's way too early for the 2008 uh, crash. She is some sort of horseback riding trainer. I guess she used to be like a show rider, but then she got hurt. And he makes handcrafted kites. You know, the kind you run around with on a breezy day. So yes, a horseback rider and a custom kite maker. Both have savings accounts and they get a home equity home equity loan so that they can buy a $750,000 house. Does that not sound like an episode of House Hunters? And what does $750,000 look like in 1990 money? Stand by. You know, this wouldn't hurt so much if it weren't for the fact this is supposed to be their first home. See, they knew they couldn't afford the mortgage, so they spent all their home equity loan money in updating the tenant apartments so that they could rent them out and make the mortgage. Meanwhile, their apartment looks like shit. And they were told that by their friend. He's like, if somebody misses one rent payment, you're going to be fucked. But they ain't listen. And then it gets worse. And Matthew Modine is certain they can make it because according to him, the vacancy percentage for the area was only 2.7%. Okay, fine, let's do it. So the first apartment is rented by a very lovely Japanese couple. And then the second one is where the bone of contention comes in. And this is why I say the movie got worse. I say got worse. It did not stand up to the test of time. So the first gentleman talks to Melanie Griffith and he's like, I can't afford the down payment in total. I can give you half now and half at the end of the month. And she's like, okay, you still have to fill out an application. We got to run your credit and whatever. But everything then seemed to be fine. And then so Michael Keaton shows up and tells Matthew Modine that he's already talked to Patty and wants to make an offer for six months of rent right up front. Matthew Modine was like, okay, but you still got to fill out an application. We have to run a credit track. And Michael Keaton was like, well, I don't have regular credit, but I can give you some references. Because apparently that's the same thing. Matthew Modine's like, okay. And he's never actually able to get through to most of the references except Beverly D'Angelo. And that was good enough for Matthew Modine. But then Melanie Griffith's like, well, we already ran the credit to the other guy. And he was here first come, first serve. He was fine. And then Matthew Modine. He was all like, well, this guy's offering us six months up front. And called the guy something of like a discrimination predator? Or something to that effect. And told Melanie Griffith that the other guy is going to make the excuse that she is a racist because she wanted to run his credit. Could you take a guess why he said that? Odds are, your guess wouldn't be wrong. And then I was like, fuck. But I had to know whether or not this was the movie I was thinking about, so I pressed on. And then he decided he was going to rent to Michael Keaton, to which the money never went through. Not once, not even a little bit. His transactions never went through. But technically, he has tenants' rights because he signed the lease, he just never paid any money, and then they had to go through the system to get him evicted. They tried to turn off his power and his heat, they coaxed him from the home, and that was illegal, apparently. And just a whole slew of other things. They get into an altercation, Michael Keaton takes out a restraining order on Matthew Modine. Matthew Modine directly defies the, uh, uh, restraining order, 
and goes back into the house because technically it's his house, but he shouldn't be. And then Michael Keaton shoots him in the arm and Michael Keaton can say that it's self-defense. And I was like, why did you go in the house? His excuse that he was checking on his wife, but like still. Either way, I'm going with Matthew Modine's fault. Um, the end. I'm going to give it a 4 out of 10. I'm taking points off 1 because this was not the movie I was thinking of. And 2, everything that happened is fucking Matthew Modine's own fault. So if you're asking whether or not I feel bad for him, the answer is no. Okay, bye. I always feel like somebody's watching me.